Welcome to chapter four of the book of Jeremiah. Today, we're going to continue the same discussion we had in chapter three. So if you remember from chapter three of Jeremiah, it was a lot of, of uh, a revelation from God talking about the problems and challenges that, that Judah was having, basically. The wickedness of Judah, uh, what are the issues that they're dealing with, how God wants to help them, but they're limiting what he can do to help them because of their choices to be wicked. So in chapter 4, we're getting continuation of that same uh, message, basically. So let's jump in and get started here. Uh, verse 1, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. Now, if you look at this, uh, this is not telling them, here's, you know, last chapter was, here's all the bad stuff you've done. Now this is the chapter of please make a different choice. Please repent and choose to come to me. Get rid of your old ways and come to me. Basically, come back to God. Uh, one thing that's fascinating about this is there's they use both directions in here, which I really like. So turn away. There's an away from pattern, and then there's a towards pattern. When you think of direction, these are key key linguistic patterns to look at. So in this one, they're saying turn away from false gods and turn to the real God, basically. So we're getting both patterns in there, basically. So by giving him two points of reference as well, you get a straight line. What's the fastest, shortest distance between two points? It's a straight line. So it isn't just turn away, turn away, turn away. It's now that you're turning away, here's the direction you need to go. Basically, so go away from this point and towards this point. When you have two points for reference, you can have movement. So it's really nice how this is set up to help say, this is what you want to move away from and this is what you want to move towards. That helps you to have the reference of proper movement. Basically, it's not just move away from this and go wherever you want. It's move towards this. Here's your goal. Here's what you want to avoid. So go this way. So I like how that's, Set up. That's what repentance is about, turning away from the stuff that keeps us from God and spending some time turning towards God, coming closer to him. That is in a, just so beautiful that they have that lined out for us, basically. Now, verse two, and thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment and in righteousness, and the nation shall bless themselves in him and in him shall they glory. Now, when you look at this, th this is a, a verse about performing oaths. That's when it talks about thou shalt swear. This is making an oath or a covenant with God, a promise, basically. So to acknowledge God in your life and to do this in a manner of truth and righteousness, or in other words, to do it with full purpose of heart and not just give lip surface to God. So when you, we're, we're proclaiming God is alive, he is true, and he is righteous, and he has proper judgment, he is accurate in what he does, he's honest, has integrity, those kinds of things, and then glory in him, get blessed by him. So be truthful in what you're doing. Now, when you look at this idea of, in, and the nation shall bless themselves in him, that is, they will discern in the example of Israel that the source of true blessings lies in Yahweh or God, basically, and that he dispenses his blessings to those who are obedient to his covenant. So those who follow God will get blessed by God. If we truly follow him, not just act like we follow him, but truly follow him. Verse 3, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Now this is, you might look at this and go, why is that, why is God saying, break up your fallow ground, so disc the ground up, till it up, basically break it up, and don't sow among thorns, don't spread those seeds out in a bad places, because you're not going to get a harvest there. Now this is kind of a cool idea, because if you think about one of the parables, the Savior taught in the New Testament is about sowing seeds. There was different types of ground that the seeds got sown on, if you remember that parable of the sower, some great things 
So symbolically, when we look at verse 3, this means new ground or virgin ground. When we look at the word fallow ground, this is new ground or virgin ground, ground that has not been tilled up and planted on for a long time at least, if not forever. Uh, the area that has been used in the past has been so neglected that thorns have taken over, so they need to plow new ground. Israel has collected, sorry, I lost my spot there. Israel has created so many bad habits that they needed to start over and improve. And, and that's true from all the things we've seen in, so far, we're going to see more of it as we go through the book of Jeremiah, how wicked the people had gotten. Okay, they hadn't. If we think of even everything we learned from Isaiah, that's it's all still here. They're still that wicked, basically. Uh, so it's it's time to start over, start fresh. We just need to get rid of it the way we have it now and start over, basically. So a new generation or a new beginning. They could not use the same as in the past. It was too polluted with sin. Now this might also talk about starting over after the exile. So we could see this as uh, kind of a forward-thinking prophecy, too, of this isn't the group that's going to return. Just like when Moses brought the people out of Egypt, wanted to take them to the promised land, the people wouldn't accept it. So they wandered for 40 years, let that generation die, so that the new generation could come that would be prepared to enter the promised land. So we could see this in the idea of the exile that is coming for Jerusalem is... The exile is the opportunity for the older generations to go away, the new generations to come up with new ideas, and to come in and take over, basically. Uh, so let's move on with verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So using the, there's the metaphor of circumcision in here, circumcising your heart is, is the important point. It's not so much literally being circumcised, but circumcising your heart. So the Lord taught in numerous places in the scriptures that the true circumcision after a person is accountable is that of the heart. It's in Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Romans. Uh, one must accept the covenant in his heart and become sinless through faith, repentance, and baptism. That's in the Old Testament study manual. So this is the important thing for us. This is the contrite spirit. Humbleness, contrite spirit, broken heart, contrite spirit, the humbleness, the humility, all that pulled together is what they're talking about with it when they say circumcise your heart. Okay? Be humble. Be contrite. Be open and willing to accept the will of God. Be faithful on God, even though you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So those are all the things that are good for us to be doing, just as much as in ancient Israel. Now let's go to verse 5. Declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Now that's, uh, trumpets are used for announcements, battle cries, for warnings, for big announcements and things. He says, Cry, gather together, and say, Assemble yourselves. Let us go into the defensed cities. Now, this is really an interesting thing to, to consider because this is preparing for war. It's, verse 5 is telling them, warning them, there is a warning, go to the defense cities. So there were cities, there were cities you would live in that had a lot of free commerce and opportunities. Then there were cities that were meant to be your defense cities. Like these are the highly fortified cities where you go to in the event of a problem. If there's an invading army, you leave your main city, take your goods with you, go to the defense city. You've got a house there, like a backup city, and then you live in the defensed city until the threat is gone. Uh, and so that's what they're preparing for is get to your defenses. Be prepared for something that is coming. Now, mo there has been much debate among scholars as to whom this invasion from the north is. We're going to see this in verse 6 as well. Uh, in fact, let me read about verse 6 real quick. That there's some great stuff in there, and then I'll continue that thought for just a second. Uh, so verse 6 is, Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. So Zion is the defense city. Come to God's city, basically, for your protection. 
Uh, some think of the now when when we think about this idea, this is a this is one of the first revelations in Jeremiah's ministry. Okay, we're still early on in his ministry, probably still around 627, 625 ish time frame uh, BC, most likely. Now, at this time, there was a situation, and some scholars kind of debate this. So there was a group called the Scythians. They moved through the area to fight Egypt. Uh, but the thing is, some, some scholars will say, oh, this, this is Jeremiah's first prophecy is about the Scythians. Now, the Scythians came from the north. They came down the coast. So they came out of the more uh, above Damascus and, and that area. Almost, I think, more, I think the Scythians came more from like Greece area and then came down the coastline in an effort to march around the Mediterranean. Instead of sail across it, they marched around the Mediterranean to fight Egypt. As they did this, they bypassed Jerusalem not long after Jeremiah gave this prophecy. So some scholars say, well, that was the prophecy that Jeremiah gave. But the problem with that is, is the Scythians didn't come into Jerusalem. They passed by Jerusalem. They kind of hit some of the some of the Philistine areas because the Philistines are on the coast where present day Gaza is, the, the Palestinian area called Gaza. That's where the Philistines lived back then in the in ancient world. So they kind of came down through that area uh, and on the way back up, they, they took out a few Philistine cities and then just kept marching. So they didn't influence Judah at all. So it's hard to say that that's fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, the the challenge is, is, and this is a good example for us to look at prophecy. Sometimes we think certain things happen that that will we'll see something like, oh, okay, a prophet gives a prophecy. Suddenly there's a condition that could look like it matches, and then it's over, and the rest of the prophecy doesn't come fulfilled. Sometimes people will see this as, oh, you must have been a false prophet. Because if this was the way it was done, if this was what the fulfillment was, your prophecy didn't come all the way true. And this is a sticky situation because you could look at it that way. And I'm sure some people saw Jeremiah as a false prophet because of this in his day. But you have to understand, if it doesn't fulfill the prophecy, then maybe that's not the signs we should be looking for to fulfill the prophecy. So maybe it's in the future still. That wasn't the, the what Jeremiah's prophecy was talking about, which we now know is true. He was talking about the Babylonians, not the Scythians coming through. Uh, but just a bit of history on, on that as well. So I'm sure this even challenged Jeremiah a little bit to go, I made this prophecy that was vague about a group coming from the north, but it hasn't happened yet. It was still, I mean, think about it. If this is around the 620 BC period, it's not till 587 BC. BC. So what would that be? 20, almost 40 years later before this prophecy would come to fruition. So in the meantime, people are going, what is Jeremiah? Is he a real prophet? Is he not? We don't know. So verse seven, the lion is come from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. Now the lion, this is really interesting. I don't know if you realize this. There are lions that live not, or used to live, I should say, outside of the Palestine area, over between Jordan and Israel today. There were forests. There were jungle areas practically over there uh, where, the, where they had lions actually that would live. So the lion, renowned for its destructive killing and power, a.k.a. Babylon, was about to come out of the thicket where it stayed hidden till it sallied forth on the hunt. So this time frame, Babylon is starting to become a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and, and like we talked about in the book of Isaiah, uh, when you think of the Assyrian conquests, Babylon was a hard one. Assyria tried and tried and tried to work with Babylon. And when the Chaldeans came up into that with uh, Nabopolassar, that was Nebuchadnezzar's dad became uh, was a Chaldean that became a Babylonian king. They just struggled. They just Assyria could not keep. They you know they'd have periods of time where Babylon was pretty content and happy, but then it would just go to, go crazy on them. And so they all, Assyria always struggled with Babylon. 
basically. So there, Babylon's now getting ready to become something else. Uh, verse 8, for this gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl. So now sackcloth, of course, is like a burlap type material. You put it on, you lay in the dust, you sprinkle ashes or dust on yourself. This is a sign of mourning, putting yourself in a condition of mourning. Why? For the fierce anger of the Lord is not turned back from us. God is pissed at Jerusalem and, and Israel and the people. And this is why, this is a good reason to mourn because you are, not that he's trying to punish them, but he has to follow the natural laws and they have chosen to not follow him. And so the natural law says there's a punishment that will come. Uh, verse 9, when we get into this more here, he says, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the priests shall be astonished, and all and the prophets shall wonder. So when you look at this, he talks about kings and princes, that's government, and then priests and prophets. So religious leaders and government leaders are going to freak out. Their, the heart of the king shall perish. That could be a heart attack. That could be also emotions. They're going to be just beside themselves with the destruction that is coming. And that's going to be very true. Uh, so lots and lots of things. In fact, what's funny is the prophets and the priests are going to wonder as well. Why are they going to wonder? Because most of the fault, most of the priests and prophets at this time are false. They're not going to stand there and go, look, I told you so. This is this was going to happen. That would be Jeremiah's role. All the other prophets were telling the people, don't worry about it. Life is good. We're going to be fine. And then the destruction happens and they're not fine at all. So they're going to be like, oh, guess I was wrong. Now, verse 10, then said I, ah, Lord God. Surely thou hast greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. So this is really interesting, getting into the idea. This is kind of, verse 10 is basically mocking the false prophets. Um, because again, they're claiming it's going to be peace. There's no problems. Uh, but now they're all going to be proven wrong, basically. So this is kind of God mocking the, the priests and the false prophets. Now, verse 11, it says, At that time, so when this happens, shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan nor to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. Now, this idea of a dry wind is an important one. We're going to see this come up a couple times in the rest of the book of Jeremiah as well. So keep an eye on this. The Old Testament study manual says the dry wind is the scorching desert winds which were devastating in the Holy Land if they blew very long or hard. Okay, and this is a big problem. One is they carried dust, so dust storms, but also they sucked the moisture out of the air and out of your plants, basically. So plants, animals, people, there was a terrible effect. This hot dry wind would just dehydrate everything real quick. So your crops would start to wilt and fail. You'd have more problems. You, you get, you lose moisture out of you. You know, if you're sick, that can cause uh, immune imbalances and you get more sick or have other problems. Diseases would spread faster. Uh, now the wind was not the gentle breeze used to fan away the chaff while winnowing grain, but a full hard wind basically, that that's what this is. This isn't a soft breeze. This is a bad storm, basically, a dry wind from the high places. Now, verse 13, he says, behold, he shall come up as clouds. So you think of the idea of a wind, a dust storm, clouds like a haboob coming in, if you know that from Arizona in that area. Um, and his, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. So this dry wind, this idea, is destruction. This wind, this is the dust cloud that is being stirred up as Babylonian chariots are coming to Jerusalem to destroy them, basically. 
So clouds in a whirlwind, basically in verse 13 is what we're talking about here. It shall come up as clouds, his chariot shall be as a whirlwind, basically. Babylon's troops would be like a huge thundercloud covering the sky, and its effect would be that of a tornado. So just, just coming in at you, basically. If you've ever been through a tornado storm or hurricane or something, and you see that oncoming storm coming, that's what it's going to be like when Babylon marches down on Jerusalem. Now, verse 14, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. So circumcise your heart, now wash your heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Now, the interesting thing about this is it says here that the way to escape calamity is repentance. That's what he's saying here, basically. It's not too late. You can still repent, and Babylon won't come get you. But if you don't repent, there will come a time where it's too late, and Babylon's going to come get you, even if you repent. So good advice for us, okay? We should be repenting. Sometimes there's a point of no return. Oftentimes we'll experience the results or the negative effect of our sin. Now we might not recognize it as that. We might not see it that way. We might see we get passed over for a job promotion. We get passed over for other opportunities. Uh, A car accident happens to us. you know, something happens at home or we get sick or other things like that. Sometimes we just, to us, it just feels like it's just there, but we don't realize that sometimes that could be because of the natural effect of our choices to do wickedness. Some of those are obvious. You know, if you get involved in drugs and alcohol, that's going to have an obvious natural negative effect in your life. Uh, But sometimes it's more indirect and we don't fully realize what's happening in our life, basically. But even just the idea of when we commit wickedness, we move away from God, thus lowering his ability to bless us. Just that alone can cause us problems because we're not being helped by God in our daily life. That could be seen as, as a problem as well. Now, verse 15, For a voice declareth from Dan, and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. So here's what's interesting about these. They use two references here, Dan and Ephraim. Dan was in the north. A voice declareth from Dan. Dan was a, a, uh, the tribe that they settled up in the north country. They're going to be getting hit first when Babylon comes down, basically. And then it says, and publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Ephraim was the main tribe of the northern kingdom. So it's going to be from the north that they come down and these other cities, Jewish settlements, are going to be hit first. Now, there's not the Sumerians, Samaritans, are up there now. Basically, people of Samaria, the kind of mixed group, because Assyria took some of the Jews out and brought other people in and kind of mixed them together up there in the northern kingdom during the Assyrian occupation. But those areas are going to get hit first with Babylon, so they will be able to send a runner to notify Jerusalem We're getting hit. You're next, basically. Uh, Verse 16, Make ye mention to the nations. Behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. So this is encouraging. Jeremiah, you need to publish this outside of Jerusalem. Publish this to other nations all over the place. They are going to be the witnesses that what you say is coming true for Judah basically. Verse 17, as keepers of a field, are they against her roundabouts? Because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. Now the nations are going to love the fact that there is a prophecy of the destruction of the Jews. They're going to be happy that this is going to come upon them, basically. Uh, So they don't have a lot of friends in the area, basically. Verse 18, thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. So again, this is thy wickedness because it is bitter, because it reacheth unto thine heart. This is all happening, Judah, because of your choice to be wicked. That's verse 18. You brought this upon yourself. You made your choices. And this is the consequence of your choice. 
That's the problem. Okay, so that's I mean that's good advice for us even in our day and age to think about and realize that that when again we have consequences to the choices we make all the time. So if we make a bad choice, there will be a consequence with that. And we have to we have to just realize that. And if we don't like the consequence that'll come, then don't make that choice. It's that simple. I mean, really, it, it think about it. Think about those consequences when you go to make a choice. Uh, in fact, in verse 19, as as now we're getting to this idea of, guys, it's your fault. It's your you're the ones that are making the choice. I, you know, I'm kind of my hands are tied. But verse 19, he says, my bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my heart. Now, this is Jeremiah, not God necessarily speaking this. So Jeremiah is getting this effect of, oh my gosh, there's some crazy stuff that's coming. There's some, oh wow. So he says, I am pained at my heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, oh my soul sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Remember we talked about the idea that Jeremiah gives us some insight into his thinking. This is, this is kind of getting along those lines. So Jeremiah is lamenting that the people are so wicked, they're not willing to repent, but believe they can withstand the judgments of God. That is sad. They believe that they can deal and handle any situation God will throw at them. This is a, a reminiscent of the people during Enoch's time. Enoch warned them of the great flood. Noah, his great-great-grandson, warned them of the great flood. And they said, bring it on. We are educated enough so we could mitigate a flood. And then they all died in the flood. They weren't ready for what God had for them. They, they thought they were smarter than God, and that didn't prove right. And that's kind of what Jerusalem's doing now, basically, in, in Jeremiah's time. So now when you get into this, oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. This is referring to his soul announcing that the wicked is bad. Destruction is imminent due to the wickedness of the people. This is what he has to cry to them. And in fact, in verse 20, he says, destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. Swift destruction it's coming quick. Curtains in a moment. You're not going to see this coming, folks. It is going to happen so fast you will not be able to prepare. You, you can't wait to hear it. It's coming to then get prepared for it. It's just going to come and show up. It's like it was. It, it's like in the uh, Paradise Fire over in California. You know, oh, hey, there's a wildfire coming. You got to leave by next week. No, this is, you've got 15 minutes to get out before the fire takes you. They're not going to have time to prepare. Verse 21, how long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? So again, that's that idea of warning. The standards, the big flags that would go up to warn people, we're at war, folks. The trumpet's sounding, the warnings are happening. Uh, and he's going, how long am I going to have to listen to this? Verse 22, for my people is foolish and they have not known me. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. So this is a change. Okay, verse 22, it's my people. This isn't Jeremiah speaking. This is now God at, replying to Jeremiah. So my people is foolish. They have not known me. They're not heeding the counsel of God. They haven't built that relationship with God, basically. Uh, such as children means dumb or stupid, basically. They're childlike. They're not, they're not doing what's right. They can't think straight. They can't evaluate their, their situation properly. Um, they're quick to do evil, but they're very slow or have no understanding of how to actually be good. Which, if you think about it, it you got to think about this. In order for them to be quick to do evil, evil has to be the norm. It has to be the standard of the day. They're just, it, wickedness is just how life is in that day, which is very similar to our day and age today. So be just a good warning for us as we, as we read Jeremiah, I hope it helps you to look at the world in today's world and go, oh my gosh, we're not that far off from these people. Yeah, a good warning for us. Now, verse 23, it says, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void and the heavens 
and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. Now, I'm just going to pause right there for a second. So this is really interesting to think about this idea. So he's this is kind of talking about, I was around, you know, this is God saying, I was around before the earth was formed. You know, I watched it. I was there to witness the earth being formed and to go through this. So he's kind of telling them, you know, do you want to go back to the chaos before God's creations? Do you want to undo everything and go backwards, basically? Uh, you know, the idea of the earth without form and void, that's Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2. Right there, the creation periods, basically. So great would be the destruction that it would be as if the creation had been undone, is a way to think about the destruction that they're about to face. That's a lot of destruction. A lot of destruction. Now the symbols in here of the, I beheld the mountains and they trembled. Symbols of stability are shaking. So that, I mean, we could literally translate that as an earthquake, but you realize things that look solid are shaking. So if the government seems solid, your religion seems solid, suddenly it's now being shaken because of the results of the wickedness and the consequences that are coming. Uh, and then the heavens, even all the birds of the heavens are fled. So this is life leaving or getting out of there. When nature leaves, that should be a sign of problems. Okay, that's just a good sign. Oh my gosh, nature is changing from what it used to be and it's leaving, it's fleeing. Life is getting out of here. Maybe we should follow them. Maybe they know something we don't. Uh, verse uh, 26, and I beheld and lo, the fruitful places place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So the place was a wilderness. This means, this is, so we've got to think about this in the context of where they live in the Middle East. A wilderness in the Middle East isn't a grove of trees. Like we think of wilderness as like mountains and hills with lots of trees and bushes and shrubs and stuff. No, a wilderness to them is desert, basically. So places that used to have lots of fruit and vegetation turning into desert, basically. Uh, and then the cities thereof were broken down in the presence of the Lord. Cities or major human creations being torn down, nature reclaiming the area. It's kind of what verse 26 is getting at. That that's the kind of destruction and people are going to leave the area and then nature will come in and take it over. We can even, you know, this is an interesting idea when you look at South America, how the jungle has reclaimed whole cities from ancient peoples back down there. It's, it's pretty interesting. The desert will claim the cities, basically, in the Middle East. Uh, verse 27, for thus saith the Lord, thus hath the Lord said, excuse me, the whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. Now that's a key point. We've seen this in Isaiah too. It's going to be gone. It's going to look like everything's gone, but there's going to be a little left. It's not going to be all the way gone. And verse 28, for this shall the earth mourn and the heavens above be black because I have spoken it. I have purposed it and will not repent. Neither will I turn back from it. Now, we've got we to gotta realize when we see this idea of, re, of God repenting, like we've talked about through the whole Old Testament, the philosophy is a mistranslation. It's not that God needs to repent. It's that he's not changing his mind, basically. It's the people that need to repent, not God, basically. Now, verse 29, the whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. That is destruction. People are going to go hide. People are going to get out of there. They're going to climb up into the mountains, into the caves. They're going to hide in the bushes. They're going to do whatever they can to get out of the way because the force that's coming against them when Babylon comes is going to be so bad. Now, you can hopefully you can see this is not what happened when the Scythians came through around this time. So they didn't, again, the Scythians didn't even really interact much with Jerusalem, let alone destroy them to this degree. This is still Babylon, the warning of Babylon, basically. Uh, in fact, verse 30 is an interesting one. When thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? So basically, you're going to go from 
pros what looks like you know prosperous wealthy fancy places to being destroyed so this is a great one uh from a feminine perspective verse 30 is a, it takes a feminine perspective on this destruction so when you are spoiled what will you do when when basically you can't put the makeup on when your hair is a mess when the destruction happens what are you going to do Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. Now, if we look at this, this is again talking in a more feminine term of making yourself pretty. When you get dolled up, when you get your makeup on, and you put on great clothes and jewelry and things to look really good to your lovers to those that you have been courting and working with, it's not going to benefit you in this time, basically. So clothed with crimson, Old Testament study manual says, in her extremity, like a harlot rejected by her former lovers, Judah would seek for help from false gods in an ever more desperate search for relief, but she would not find any. So that's who the lovers are. The nations like e Egypt, Egypt will try to come help and then get Push back, it won't be a help at all. The false gods that Israel has been worshiping this whole time, the gods of Baal and Ashtaroth and others, they are not going to help. So Israel at the time believes they have plenty of friends and plenty of help. But they're going to find out it's all false. It's all wrong. And that's what verse 30 is talking about from the idea of, of a harlot, a woman who has been utilizing her body to gain friends and to connect people, it's going to go bad. It's not going to work out. Now, verse 31, for I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail. So this is, this is like somebody who is a woman who is giving birth and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands saying, woe is me now. For my soul is wearied because of murderers. So this is, again, suffering the consequences of sin. It's too late to repent at that point. She's already giving birth. You can't go back, basically, now. Uh, so if you've ever experienced a woman giving birth, especially without any pain medications, that's what's going to happen. That's what the, the kind of pain and suffering and problems that Israel is going to go through, basically. Lots of destruction, lots of problems for them if they do not repent and improve. So, good warning for us. Keep repenting. Keep them keep coming closer to God because that's going to help you out. So, thanks for watching. Let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue forward.